I want to thank you um, for taking the time to join us today, whether you are right here um, in the gym or if you've joined us online. Um, really appreciate it, your time and, and hoping to continue the energy that went on with this morning's convocation, which I thought was um, outstanding. Um, Dr. Avendano's message, and, and nobody except maybe Jill Johnson, um, see, you get some theme ideas. That's how we have a convocation theme. Nobody, you know, has knows exactly what Dr. Avendano is going to say. So I heard it the first time today as you heard it, and, and I really appreciated a lot of what he um, had to say. And he's been kind enough to um, hang out for a little while and just take a, a couple of minutes to uh, give us greetings um, in academic affairs. So please help me in welcoming Dr. John Avendano. We already know I'm a man of no pretense. Slides are moving on my confidence screen. Hmm. Dr. John Avendano. <laughs> I was fully expecting to see some kind of slam against my Chicago Bears on that slide. <laughs> and quite honestly, sometimes Dr. Avendano doesn't know what he's going to say as he takes the stand either. Um, but thank you. Thank you all for, for those who were here this morning, those who are tuned in online. And again, I really just want today or this time, I don't always get that opportunity to be in front of the academic, really the core technology of what we do here at the institution. So I did ask uh, Dr. Wall or he had asked me if I would be willing to do this. And absolutely. Again, I just want to take a minute or two to sincerely say thank you for the work that you do here at the institution, right? This is, this is a core business of not only higher education, but obviously of FSCJ. I had the chance to meet some of you in the last hour, hour and a half walking around. And uh, the wealth of ideas and the wealth of suggestions is important to me. And you all bring that. And I, and I, I want to say that because in some of my conversations that I had in the last hour, hour and a half individually were from people who said, well, I, you know, I don't know if I should bring it forward or not bring it forward. This is my invitation to you to always feel comfortable bringing it forward. That's how we get better as an institution. Sometimes the, the, the nuggets that you bring forward, the ideas that you've had, and maybe they didn't take shape, shape in the past, feel comfortable to bring those things forward because they might take shape now. But I really, like I said, all I want to do today is just say thank you once again, a sincere appreciation for your commitment. Um, I'm excited for this year. I really am. I know we've had you know, a, a variety of rough things that have happened, most of which has been out of our control in the last uh, couple of years, two and a half years, but I start to feel very, very comfortable in the control that we have and in the direction that we're headed and the involvement and engagement that we have across the entire institution. And much of that is a credit to uh, many of you who are in this room. And I want it to be for everybody who, who's in this room. So with that, once again, good luck. Have a fantastic year. Know that I'm here to help serve you as well, and I look forward to seeing you over the course of this next 2022-23 school year. Thank you. Congratulations. Have a great year. It is also my honor to introduce my colleague, Dr. John Woodward, Professor of Humanities, Film Studies, and faculty senate president. He has um, 10 minutes on the agenda. I know he has comments to make. Maybe he'll have a minute to tell us about the uh, biker brawl he was almost in. <laughs> I don't remember a lot of that. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I hope your summer was relaxing or exciting or whatever you wanted it to be. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in Senate or what we are, what I am working on. Um, I've got to finalize the senators list, so I have those up uh, pretty soon, hopefully. I've got a couple of positions I need to appoint, and then I'll email out that list to everyone. And I know that's not what I normally do, but I decided, why well, I should do that. Um, I am faculty senate president again, by the way, for another two years. And I also want to say that Cheryl Schmidt 
the great, the wonderful, is Vice President again. And I want to say that Steve Milchanowski is our secretary, and I'm not sure if he's here with us. He was here this morning. So uh, same old team. We're here to help you. Let us know uh, what you need. Or if you want to serve on Senate, uh, let me know as well. So um, with that, too, I've got curriculum committee is up for selection. I'm going to sit down on Monday with the curriculum team to make the final decision on the faculty positions on curriculum committee. So if you are interested in that, Please let me know. Um, Academic Technology Committee, I think, always is looking for people. Uh, generally has some chairs open. So if you're interested in the Academic Technology Committee, please just let Cheryl Schmidt know directly. Um, and then any other committees you're interested in, just let me know. Send me a quick email. Oh, let's see. OK, so what did we do over last semester? And I think I mentioned this to a lot of you. We had a committee that ran that was called the SESI Stu Faculty Student Interaction Committee. Unfortunately, it doesn't make a good acronym, but it was a very good committee. And we have some recommendations that we put forward that I want to talk to you about. The uh, first, to give you the context, the SESI data uh, suggested that over the past decade, our faculty, from the point of view of students, our faculty-student interaction has, has declined. They have felt, they have reported that they feel um, less connected to the faculty. It's not a drastic change, but it is a fairly steady decline. So we task ourselves with trying to figure out some way of kind of shoring that up if we could. So one of our recommendations, um, and I can talk more about the data and some of the things. We did talk a bit about the data uh, and whether that had to do with online course offerings. And it turns out, no, it has nothing to do with us offering more online course offerings. It's just across the board, uh, unable to figure out why it's actually there. So um, what we wanted to think about is, one, how does this affect uh, retention? Uh, is this affecting retention? And the only way of practicing, the only way of seeing if it does is to try to change the data, change the perception to see if that actually helps us retain students a bit better. So we are strongly suggesting that we modify our Canvas courses. If you have a Canvas course, especially if it is a hybrid or a fully online course, that you um, modify it so that the home page becomes a, an actual page rather than the modules. And I think many of you are already doing this. Um, and then on that home page, put a picture of yourself, uh, maybe a short video introduction to yourself, a little bit of biographical information, especially things like uh, if you're a member or you're part of a club on a campus, or if you're part of something that, uh, where students may be interested in, in attending that particular meeting, let them know that uh, so that you can maybe talk to them about being a part of that club or being in that, coming to that event or what have you. Um, we'd only recommend that you put that for about two weeks, maybe three weeks, beginning of the semester, and then go ahead and switch it back so that it's the modules. Obviously, that's up to you. You do however you want to do, but uh, that is our recommendation. And we think what we think this will do is this will give a face to, especially for online classes, this will give a face for the faculty member. Um, if you've ever tried to search for yourself at the college, it's, it's still kind of difficult to find you. It's still kind of difficult to find a picture of you. And so connecting what you're teaching with who you are, where you are, and all of that becomes a little bit more difficult for students who are in the online environment. And even some that are in the, that live online hybrid environment that we do. So that's why we make that recommendation. Um, we have a rough template for this. If you search for, and if I mess this up, then you can slap me around later, but you should be able to filter in the Canvas Commons you should be able to filter for FSCJ and then search for home page. Is that, is that, is that roughly equivalent? <laughs> and, and it should come up as a template. You can also just make it up however you wish. Um, Brandy Bleak, I think, will also be speaking about this uh, maybe a little bit later. I don't know where Brandy is or if Brandy's with us. There, Brandy. So, and then her team is also the team to go to if you want some information about how to, uh, to make your page look uh, interesting like you wish it to be. So. Um, now, uh, one other reminder about online and hybrid. Uh, last year, the FSCJ Online Advisory Committee recommended the faculty use video recordings of lectures, short lectures, uh, topic introductions, demonstrations of concepts, whatever it is, in a short video format 
Again, with the idea of putting you into the class so that students know you feel a little bit more comfortable with you and maybe feel more comfortable uh, asking you questions, sending you emails, things like that. Um, it, it may help, it may not help. This is just a recommendation. So, now one other uh, thing to mention is the events. Uh, we, in our committee, think as well that uh, even before COVID, and there's some evidence to point this out, even before COVID, uh, we had fewer events, sort of faculty-oriented, faculty-student-oriented events, many fewer clubs, um, being offered on a number of the campuses. And so we are encouraging you to attempt uh, in this year to try to go to at least one event once a month, if you can make once a week. And more importantly, if you can't find an event that you want to attend, or you think is important for your students to sit down and create an event or create a club that you will think will help uh, your students. Um, so we have, to that extent, um, we have these new people on campuses who are called campus deans. Is that what they're called, Rich? You're one of them. Uh, and I, I think these are still the people. So one of the problems in the past, as a faculty member, one of the problems has been finding funding to get cookies or something for my students, or scheduling a class where we can sit down and do stuff, or whatever the case may be, the, the logistics of setting these events up. We now have people on each one of the campuses who are tasked with doing that for us. So uh, those are Ujwal Chakraborty on, uh, and if I butchered your last name, I apologize, on Deerwood, Carrie Roth on North Campus, I think, Carrie. Uh, Andrew Pierce is on South Campus. Rich Turner is on Kent Campus. Rich should always get an applause, right? Tara Haley is on Downtown. And Joe Lackey is on Cecil and Donna Martin should also get applause, is on um, Nassau County. All of them should get applause. But, thank you, yes. Importantly, these are, these are the people who should make it easy for you. These are the people that you should be able to go to and say, I have a great idea, and, and I'd like to do it. And they should say, uh, yes, we will do it. Now, if your budget's $100,000, they will say, um, yes, if you can raise the $100,000. Um, but if, you know, hopefully there'll be a small budget for cookie or coffee or something to make uh, those meetings pass, you know, I have to have coffee in every single meeting. So go to them, encourage, uh, I encourage you to think of things that you want to do with your students and uh, with uh, the community at large. Talk to them about setting up these events and um, hopefully we'll spark some, uh, spark some engagement on campuses again. And with that, I am done. So welcome back everyone. We'll see you in the classroom or in a meeting or something soon. Bye-bye. Oh. And I don't remember anything about that brawl, so I'm assuming I avoided it. I don't, I don't know what... Thank you, Dr. Woodward. The fact that you remember nothing probably tells us what kind of almost brawl it almost was. So. I, I do want to express um, thanks to Dr. Woodward um, and faculty senate leadership and to each of the senators. Um, I work and, and they're kind enough to afford me some time at most meetings to get and, and visit, update, we exchange, um, you know, some conversation and dialogue. Year over year, they have become um, just such an effective group in so many different ways and, and the committees that Dr. Woodard's talking about flow out of that. So um, make sure you know who your representative is and, and continue um, to engage that because it really is becoming an important engine and voice um, for faculty and for everybody at the college to advance our work. So appreciate that, John, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take um, a couple minutes to extend in a way um, Dr. Abandano's message and, and hone it towards academics. And what I had to work with was the, the theme. So I did my own degree of, of reflecting, uh, refreshing and thinking about renewing. And I'll tie it back into this um, kind of go for launch uh, theme that I want to share with you today. And the things that you see up there 
under reflect, they're going to be familiar to you because thematically they are the things that we are talking about. If I look back five years here at the institution and, and what was going well and not was going not what was going not well, what are the things we want to improve? This list thematically, I think it covers a lot of it. And when I reflected, these are the things that came um, to my mind. So we know communication uh, was, was uh, one of those things, right? And, and we've worked to hopefully do a little bit better at that kind of thing. The one that's killing me right now is enrollment, enrollment. So 2018-19 was the only year that I've been in this position that we were up and it wasn't even quite a percent. It was essentially level. And, and we know what is happening with enrollment. We tracked, we tracked even with last year, very, very late into the summer this year, and our AA program, um, AA enrollments um, were steady. Our enrollments in um, AS programs were steady. Our career certificate enrollments were up. Adult education was up. And what we saw was a drop in baccalaureate programs. And we figured people are out there working right now and flexibility and they have to come back. When we got to the last drop for non-payment, then we got the separation, and so we've been riding between 3 and 4% down right now. Um, we absolutely understand collectively, and to the degree that people at the institution have responsibility for this, are, are working on it. So that's certainly part of my reflection. So I'm not going to stick on enrollment, but I'd, I'd be remiss to not talk about that, because we know we've got to do something with that um, in terms of the college. But when I look around at the, the quality and the quantity of work that's being done, and reflect on that, I am simply, simply blown away. I had an opportunity to tell you all last year, and I want to tell you all this year, you all are remarkable as a faculty body. The way you have engaged students, the way you have been flexible, the way you have kept, kept on persevering, and, and not only just surviving, right, but thriving. We have a ton of achievements across the college, and you heard Dr. Avendano talk about some of them this morning. And so when I think about refresh, we're trying to catch a little bit of that breath of fresh air. And for me, I think about two things. One are processes, which the tone I've tried to set in academics and will continue to set is that we need to be that continuous improvement place that when somebody says this isn't working, we stop and we look and we say, how can we get it to work better? We don't just set it and forget it. And there's too many processes to fix all at once, but we continually want to engage that. And what that also means is having the humility, right, and, and not being overly sensitive to the fact that when a process isn't working, that we have to kind of point the finger and saying, you know, why are you doing this to me? It's the processes sometimes that fail, not the people. We just want to keep on working on that. And then I'm very, very interested in that idea of refreshing us as individuals. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a second. So now when it comes to renewing, um, this is what I believe. I talked last year about the idea of, of the excellence option, the excellence option. And I'm gonna revisit that briefly today. But what I'll start with is saying that there are some fundamentals, and I have talked about these fundamentals. Y'all have bared with me talking about these fundamentals every time we've gotten together for academic plenary. The fundamentals, from my mind, do not change. We could put different language to them, but I think this covers the waterfront in terms of what we are and need to bring to the party in academics, especially when we're interacting with students. I'm going to start by talking about the notion of a vibrant academic culture. It is my belief that to be effective in teaching, those of us who have chosen to, to, that our vocation or recognize our vocation as being teaching we need to be in a professional environment that we're not just serving others, but that feeds us as well. I believe we are wired in a way that whatever your skill or your craft is, you feel a call to share it. And you're also energized by the energy that comes back. So that if you're working in a place that is not feeding back to you, it's going to grind you down. We have to get to a place where there's a vibrant academic culture, and we are working on that in all kinds of areas, and I want to keep pushing. I love what uh, John talked about in terms of where are the places where we could start a club? What are the things that we could support and attend? And you're going to hear a little bit more about that um, this year. Rigor and rapport. I want to say it to you directly, again. And if you hear or think or see anything different, please come talk to me, because I know me saying it doesn't necessarily make people believe it. The standard is the standard. 
Student success is not code for they got to pass. You got to get the grades. It is not code for that at all. You stop. Oh, Dr. Woodard and Cheryl, thank you. That's a very nice golf applause. We have to have that locked down and you have to be confident about teaching there. What is unique about us at FSCJ, what should be unique about the community college experience, but we wanna really take this to a fine point, is that the rapport that we bring with students, that's the difference. And that does not mean, hey, I'm gonna do you a solid and get you over this hump. I'm gonna let you take this shortcut. What it means is that in everything, from the way that we greet students, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, and I love the idea the committee came up with in terms of, let's get our faces out there, let's give opportunity, you know, that there's a gap that students are looking at. We wanna close that gap so they can approach us with their questions, with their needs, so we can uncover those kinds of things. The rapport is the separate part that has to do with making it a challenge that students can embrace, that they will embrace. And you all have that skill. I've seen so many of you in the classroom, in different situations, working with students, and I've heard stories about these things. It's there. We need to make sure we put that into our culture and keep it there. That is a core part of the fundamentals. The other piece I wanna mention here in terms of the fundamentals, wide fences and a bias toward yes. If you've got an idea, we need to have it out on the table. And we are more organized as an institution than we have ever been in terms of places to put those ideas. So please get involved and connect and bring those things. The connections are all gonna be there and when they go, that's when we're gonna get to that next step. So when I talked last year about the um, excellence option, I made a distinction between what I would call individual excellence and what I mentioned to everybody was the United States basketball team in the Olympics. We had all these superstars and we went and we flopped in a game. And the point was you can have great players, but if they don't play as a team, they do not achieve and that we have to play as a team. And I said, let's move away from pockets of excellence to the excellence option. And the reason it's an option is that as a community college, we're doing okay, but we're not doing great. And we want to do great. Our community deserves us being great. We can fulfill our mission to the highest extent. So it's the excellence option because we can kind of go along. This isn't where any of us wants to be. We want to be better. Dr. A mentioned us being in the top 50, according to the Aspen Institute. We want to continue to climb in that. And that's going to feed back to being part of a culture that energizes you because not only are good things happen, you're proud about the place where you work and you're out in the community and you're saying, yes, I am FSCJ. But when I reflected a little bit further on it, and it's one of the reasons I wanna revisit it this year, I thought about the fact that we are well past pockets of excellence at this point. We really have pervasive excellence. There's not a campus you can go to, there's not a building you can go into, there is not um, a discipline or a program being taught where you cannot readily find excellence. It's everywhere, it's everywhere. But back to that basketball team, what can we do to function as a team? And that has to do with integrating the things that we are doing. That has to do with better communication. That has to do with if you are a faculty member in a program or a discipline, and there are some hard conversations out there about what the curriculum should look like, you go ahead and you tackle that conversation and say, how can we get the whole thing to work together? We've come together under one umbrella in terms of disciplines. There's always trade-offs, right? Because then there's a question of campus community. But we cannot have, we do the X discipline at South Campus and the very same discipline at Kent Campus does their thing. And we have different views about this. That is not integration. And that's the thing that's gonna move us to the next place. And that's the challenge I'd like to put before us this year. There's everything I just talked about. Sorry about that, missed my slide. Um, it's a comprehensive uh, com approach. Here's another part. It has to have comparable standards. Those of you that teach in programs that have licensure at the end, you have a comparable objective standard out there that you know. We all oohed and odd. I heard it. Dr. Jeff Smith and our dental hygiene faculty, right? 13 years, nobody's failed. That is fantastic. 
And you know what else made it kind of extra fantastic? The thing that nobody failed is a national board. And that national board is the same thing that every other student in the country has taken. So I've heard this challenge, and I recognize it's a challenge. I don't know how to solve it, but we can together. How do I know that the way I'm teaching this course is the same experience in terms of how somebody else is doing it? And we could say, well, it's all in the course outline. There you go. What can we do so that we know that our standards are compared? That's integration because then we got to sit around, define the problem, and then we're back to now what's the most effective way to teach students. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in the year upcoming. Reflection, I did not realize until a week or two ago, um, we're going back to the moon. How many of you knew we were going back to the moon? Okay, I woke up, I came out from under my rock. Dr. Mike Reynolds has been on my mind. Those of you that knew, uh, um, yeah, he gets applause, right? When I think about anything that has to do with astronomy, space, work in space, um, Dr. Mike Reynolds is never far from my mind. That dude taught me in 10th grade. He taught me in 11th grade. And then we showed up and we were colleagues at FSCJ. I have such tremendous affection for him. And we're rolling this rocket back out and we're getting ready to go back to space. I think it's incredible. I have awe and I also think about Mike and the gift that he gave. And we should always appreciate our faculty while they're here um, because of the great work that they're doing. That's something for me to continue to think about. But as I look at that, I watched and, I, and then I got curious and I thought, oh, the first thing we're doing is we're sending a flight without anybody on board. We're going to go up and see if we can do it without people. That makes sense. Ultimately, we're sending people back to the moon and NASA has a diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging agenda. I think that's fantastic. It's everywhere. First, they're going to go to the moon unmanned, then we're going to get back to it. And the reason is that they need to roll out and they want to do a test flight. They want to know, is this thing going to work before we push it further and do the next step? And what I want to suggest to us for this year, in my mind, this year is a sort of test flight for FSCJ. It's not pockets of excellence. We have pervasive excellence. We are fulfilling the mission. We are there. But can we get to the heights? When Will Holcomb was here as interim president, I have shared this with you before. He said, FSCJ has always been a good institution. It deserves to be a great institution. It's this stuff. It's about getting to the moon. How are we going to get there? We have to build a system that works in an integrated fashion. When you talk about a test flight, and excuse me while I read, I forgot my notes there. A test flight does two things. First, it provides an opportunity to observe, measure, and evaluate a flight vehicle's performance characteristics. What are the capabilities of this machine? Or secondly, you can ask particular questions. We've just made this adjustment. Is it working or not? We just heard Dr. Woodward say, you know what? This is a recommendation of the committee. It may work, it may not. But we recommend you give it a try. That's the right mentality here. Give it a test flight. I'm not here today to make any ask or to proclaim any new initiative and say, here's the next thing we're doing. We know what we're doing. You all know what you're doing in your disciplines, your departments. I am asking us to think about ways to integrate, but I don't want to leave it there. What I do want to alert you to is I want to take responsibility on myself and my team to touch on these eight things this year that I think will help that integration. So I want to let you know what I want to work on, and I hope it has an effect on the way we are all doing our work. First of all, we want to grow our capacity, right, in terms of equity-minded work. You're going to hear some more about that in a little while. Secondly, we want to expand renewing colleague-to-colleague -colleague opportunities. You all are a remarkable bunch. I have the honor of knowing so many of you. Getting us together more is just a good thing. Not for a committee, just to get together and spend some time. We need to do that to enrich ourselves. I want to work on giving you those opportunities this year. Examining points of engagement. 
What's getting attention, what's not? How do we know that in all the things that we need to be doing in academics, are we getting it all done and do we have everybody pulling weight there? We need to learn a little bit more about that. And so we're gonna take a look at that. Map student progression and critical loss momentum points. I can come here and tell you, retention is something we have to focus on, but I recognize if I can't tell you who's leaving, why, when, where in their program progression, it's a shot in the dark. So this year, I wanna work on giving you some information so you can look at it as an individual, as a department, as a discipline, and say, aha, here's something that the data is saying about our students. What could we do that might help to correct this? So that's on me to start the conversation, and I hope you'll continue it. Provide course level data as focus points for review. We have, through Dr. Dumichel, a fantastic data dashboard. We have fantastic data summits every year, and they give us inklings. What I have not given you is an opportunity to deepen those discussions so we come together and like, that's really interesting. I gotta get back to work. So what we are going to do this year is we are going to send to departments, to disciplines, course outcome data so they can look at it in aggregate, in aggregate. I'm not looking for, you know, you're doing well. You're not, I'm not about, you know, trying to ask that question. But how could we look collectively in an integrated fashion? And so we're gonna provide that and ask you all to take a look and work on those things. More golf applause from uh, academic leadership. Thank you. Oh, wow. Here's something for the administrators in the room. You didn't know this was coming. Assess academic administrative systems. I'm doing a 360 this year. Right now, right here, I'm going to ask academic administrators to do 360s this year. We need input on how we're doing. Those who are faculty senators, y'all know I have been months coming back and saying, I want input so that we can construct a survey that helps us understand what do y'all need from administrators, and then we can ask, how are people doing? I want to get that feedback so we can do better, and it's the same principle. It's the same principle. I cannot ask you to go out and look and you know, say, what can we do as a group, as a department to do better, if I'm not also asking you, what can I do better? What can my team do better? What can administrators do better? So we are all in it together. That is coming this year. Okay, review of academic systems. Explore FSCJ's capabilities as a comprehensive institution. There's nobody here, anybody here, who knows everything that we do. Let's take a little poll. If you think about, let's just stick with academics. Let's just stick with academics. Let's not even talk about athletics, student clubs, et cetera. For now, let's just stick about academics. There are, there's one AA program. There are 48, maybe, AS programs. There are 13 baccalaureate programs. How many of you know 100% of what those things are? Let's go down. I think I know. Okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Bart. Yes, we're working grants. How many of you know about 90% of what those are? All right, I like it. I see administrator hands going up. How many of you know 80%, 70%, 60%, 50, 40? See, now we're into it. 30, 20, 10. You don't need to be deep in the woods. But if you didn't know about our dental program, what's happening there, reminded that, oh my goodness, we have this new facility and it is fantastic. And God, Jeff Smith seems like a good guy. I wanna to get to know him. I wanna to get to know this faculty. In 13 years, we have to teach ourselves our own story. I'm in a privileged position where I see how good you all are. What I have not done enough of is reflect that back to you. And so that's one of the things I want to do. I want you to understand how great we are in a comprehensive sense. And then lastly, and then lastly, the community. And we got to do two things. And, and this is a charge from Dr. A, and he is dead on. We need to be further out in the community, and we need to do more to bring the community in. This is not a to-do list for you all. These are things that I want you to know on my reflection thematically I want to work on because I do think it'll help the institution. So today, you got plenty on your mind. Just absorb this as an idea and know that a little bit more is going to be coming. 
Two housekeeping notes. First of all, the state legislature continues to pass items that have implications for curriculum. They are so extensive that we're not even going to talk about them this year at plenary. I've talked with Dr. Seesvolz, and we are going to, once we get over the initial uh, launch and rush of this year, we're going to set up something that you can attend in person or virtually, and, and we want to walk through some of those things so that everybody is up to speed. And we need to continue not just to know about this, but to think about this, um, because we are part of the conversation of, of how are these things going, you know? Secondly, I want to affirm to you directly, because the conversation that comes out following some of these curricular changes and mandates, the rhetoric that, that comes behind them. If you walk into an issue of academic freedom, doing your job, the way you're supposed to be doing your job, I will be right there with you. Now, what that's worth to you, <laughs> what that's worth to you in terms of you know, actual outcomes, I'm not optimistic. But I do want to let you all know, I will be right there with you. What we do is so important. I deeply appreciate you all doing it. I want to let you know that we do have pervasive excellence. I'm excited about this year ahead and look forward to working with you. Thank you all very much. At this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Deborah Fontaine uh, to come on up here. Um, Deb is a real, uh, she's a, such a pleasure to work with and everything that is strategic in nature, you know, our larger work on assessment, um, activities that we're doing with our strategic plan, the work that we're doing with ATD and guided pathways, she has really turned those wheels and done it in a way that does have that great rapport. Um, so I appreciate y'all um, sharing your attention with her. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Oh, good afternoon, colleagues. It is really so great to see so many of you um, today face to face. It's, it's great to have us all back. And I really do appreciate um, the opportunity to speak with you today. I wanted to take a few minutes in alignment with some of the, the um, topics we've been talking about to talk more about culture at, at FSCJ. And I know I'm usually the one that talks about the strategic planning and you'll hear a little bit about that and guided pathways and data and that sort of thing. Um, but I really, uh, well, really want to emphasize that success in those areas is driven by the culture that we create here at FSCJ. When I first came on um, board to FSCJ three years ago, I saw this picture in one of the student success reports. Um, and I'd come from a faculty position, so I'd, I'd been there and, and um, had plenty of students and watched them graduate. But when I read the words on the student's mortarboard, I thought, this is like a, a super cool place to be. I was so excited. Because um, she's talking about not her degree or not the certificate that she may have been earning, but the fact that she was sad to leave the place. It was it's hard to say goodbye because it was such a great place. Um, and she's accurate and it has, it has certainly held through the, you know, the difficult times that we've had. But, but clearly the student, to write that on her mortarboard, was experienced a sense of belonging at the institution and an engagement that positively impacted her life. It made me think about my previous students when I had been teaching and the impact that I may have had on them. Um, and I, I did have some students and have students that, that keep in touch and thought, you know, I have had this great positive impact on, on students' lives. But as I've worked more intently here in our student success work, whether it's through achieving the dream or guided pathways or strategic planning, and I've engaged with more people at the institution, um, I had to sit back and really honestly reflect on whose, student, whose lives I impacted. And although I did, did some positive, um, positive things, there were some folks that I left behind. And so what I've learned here is that whether it's intentional or unintentional, that there are things that, that I can improve upon. And so some of this um, idea of building culture, um, I think really helps put the foundation for the remainder of our student success work. So wanting to create better student experiences, whether we're teaching our students or we're working with students from an administrative standpoint, 
It's really important to know where we are. Dr. Wall just alluded to that, that we need to have this foundation of, we, we need to have the data, we need to know what we, um, where, we're, where we are in a situation, and then determine what our goal is and, and move on from there so we can better measure it. So starting with the end in mind, I know we look at data quite a bit. We look at quantitative data, um, but we, we don't always look as closely at the qualitative data and the student voice and that mortar board picture and some of the things that our students might say about us or in, in surveys or reflections. Um, but looking at what they value, I think really helps inform some of the work that we have. And so my challenge is for all of us, administrators, faculty, staff alike, is what are some of the little things that we can do? Um, Dr. Woodward talked about some of the things from SESI survey and, and, and looking at something as simple as putting a picture on, on a home page. Um, as we look at our own work and we look at the things that we're engaged in, what are some of the little things that we can do to help our students have these sorts of responses and experiences at the institution? So again, from a more data <laughs> standpoint then, um, the student perception of their experiences is, is obviously critical. Um, but with that qualitative feedback, we need to partner that with some quantitative. Um, and again, I hadn't seen Dr. Wall's uh, chat before, but talking about sharing out that data. We talk about it quite a bit. Um, we just referred to like our data summits and some of the, the workshops and things that we do through the academy and when our, our ATD coaches come on board. But getting down to a little closer level so that we understand what's happening in our own areas and how we might be able to positively impact um, success uh, as low as the course level and then thinking about it too in terms of our own classes. We know what we're doing, we know our students, we know um, what, that, what that success looks like. What sorts of things can we do to meet our own expectations as we move forward? So in the spirit of our convocation um, um, themes to reflect, uh, refresh and renew, I wanted again just to highlight some of the, the larger activities that we're doing at the institution. Um, how many of you were at convocation this morning and saw Dr. Wall's video? That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you all for being at convocation. But these are the major activities that we're, that we're working on from an institution-wide level. I want to talk about them a little out of order here, but just to, to give you kind of a brief update and, and understand where we are and, and, and where we're going with some of this work. Our QEP, um, is, is uh, focused on distance learning. And we really just launched um, the idea of what we're going to identify as our um, learning outcomes or our success outcomes for that project. Um, Dr. Mark Bosey and Dr. Audrey Ante are co-leads for that project. So you'll be hearing from them as the semester goes on. And I encourage you to, to listen when they have opportunity to, to share out and participate when we ask for feedback as we continue to build out that plan. It's important. The um, top three activities here, we have our guided pathways, our visionary impact plan, and our DEI and B council. Um, and although we're not, we haven't done like a 360 with this, I do want to, to A, commend everybody for the work that they are doing in those three areas. Um, it is it's a, a, a lot of extra activities sometimes, and your, your participation and your thoughts and ideas um, are critical to, those, um, to the success. What I do want to say also with that is that we have, we've heard, we've listened that as we have launched these larger projects that are all a part of equitable student success, that there's a little bit of overlap or, or some things that might not be quite clear as to you know, who's on first. And we are working on in the next few weeks, I know you get a lot of email, I know that we have on point once a month, all sorts of different sorts of communication, but open those emails when we, when we get a, a new plan out and clarify and make sure that everybody feels a part of what they want to participate in um, and, and can know exactly where we are. So we will be doing a better job, too, of clarifying those roles, uh, making sure that you're informed, and giving you opportunities to participate, whether it's just listening and learning so you know what's going on, providing advice from your, your area of expertise, or actually getting in there and doing some of the work when, when you have the capacity to do so. Um, a couple of things I wanted to go ahead and celebrate as I uh, close out here. And you may hear some of the, um, this from Dr. Bosey when, when he comes up as well. 
Um, one of the activities that we've engaged in through Achieving the Dream is, is building capacity for change. And I hope that most of you have heard about that. Um, a group of faculty um, administrators got together in the fall, went through a, a series of um, seminars, and, and the, a couple of things have come out of this. But one of the biggest things is this culture responsive pedagogy cer certificate and micro credentials. Faculty built, faculty led. Um, we launched this project in April, which was such a fabulous time for faculty, right? We could have done it December 1st and maybe hit a, hit a worse time. Um, that said, you know, we've had over 40 faculty participate in the program, so I don't know what the numbers are now, Mark, in terms of certificate completion, but we have at least one who's completed the certificate and probably over 10 now, or three, three certificates. That's a lot, that's 11 modules somebody got through, 11 workshops, um, and, and well over 10 that have completed some micro-credentials. Look for those opportunities. This is, these are fabulous workshops, again, built by, by your faculty, um, your, your peers, um, and, and uh, this is an opportunity, again, to, to establish that um, cultural uh, foundation within the institution. The other thing that I wanted to highlight about this work is it has been highlighted nationally. ATD is watching what they're doing. They want to know how this rolls out, how faculty participate. Does it change the culture? Does it help with student success? Um, it's been referenced in several um, articles that have been published nationally. So we are doing things, you all are doing things, that are highlighting the institution and the great faculty that you are. So I encourage you to watch some of that work and participate when you're able. Um, one other thing that came from that, um, that activity, the, the building capacity, um, was a faculty retreat. Um, we had, this was held just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had 19 faculty participate. Um, they stayed at the Hyatt Riverside downtown just overnight. Um, but it was just a tremendous success um, from what I understand. I was there for bits and pieces of it. Um, but faculty were engaged. You can tell by the pictures. Hopefully you can see some. Um, they, it was all fun. Everybody was having a great time, even in the, the workshop portions. Um, we'll be doing that again next year, so I encourage you to, to watch for that and, and look for those other opportunities. So I'd like to close with just asking us all to take a little time to refresh ourselves. I know the Reflect was supposed to be first, but we're already back. Um, but refresh yourself, take time to take care of yourself, take care of your colleagues, your students, and then engage in the work where you've got the capacity to do so, because it takes everybody, it's going to take the whole faculty to move the, the, this work forward and to, and to help our students. So I thank you very much for your time and wish you a fabulous start to your semester. Thank you. As he makes his way to the uh, dais here, thanks, Mark. Um, I, I did just make a little comment today during um, convocation about how strong our training organizational development is, and I'm going to confine it here. The Academy for Teaching and Learning, um, Susan Slavitz, you are the faculty pioneer. You uh, forever um, have mine and others' gratitude for the, for the work that you've done. I know you love the attention, and um, and the work that Mark has done, uh, just just tireless. The retreat, um, not the retreat, before the retreat, um, the national workshop that um, a number of faculty participated in. Mark was there um, over the semester. Our teaching and learning academy. When other colleges heard about it, he was. Everybody wanted to talk to him. We've really got something special here. I hope you make the very most use of it. It's my pleasure to bring up Mark and then Audrey. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Um, it's just like a, pl a pleasure and honor to work for you all. Um, there, coming into this role six years ago, they were talking about kind of the squishy department that's going to be, you know, faculty development and org development kind of mixed in there and training, et cetera. And it's nice to um, actually be asked to be part of these publications and part of these studies. And we get in the room with 
extremely high achieving universities and colleges and they ask what we're doing and they're floored with what our faculty are doing here. So um, just thank you all for, for the honor to keep working for you all. Um, I want to share and celebrate some numbers with you over this past year. Um, I didn't memorize the numbers, so I'm going to look down at this monitor they've got there. Um, and Jennifer, if you want to move forward on the next slide. What's that? Oh, there's a clicker. Good. I was told earlier that someone else would be clicking. That's all. So I'll be clicking. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> By the way, the list of the things that are going on this year that, that Deb had on there, I went, oh yeah, I'm part of that and that and that and that and that. So, and then I looked at Audrey Ante and said, hey, aren't we part of all of those? We need your help. We can't do the QEP alone. We can't do all that stuff alone. So um, please um, do answer the emails and phone calls if Audrey and I call. I'm afraid you're going to avoid us from now on uh, like a plague. Um, and then also the 360s. I'll start working on that, I guess, too. Thank you. <laughs> um, just some numbers to share with you. This is uh, the highest numbers uh, since I came to the institution for um, professional learning. Um, if you'll notice, I started using a term called professional learning instead of professional development. I think that that term digs a little bit deeper into what we're actually doing. This is an ongoing learning process. This isn't training where we drop something on your head and say, learn this. This is something that's ongoing, so I wanted to change that dialogue. And if any of you have been checking my emails over the last year from the training and work development department, you've seen it no longer says professional development for you or professional development for the week of. This is an ongoing process. It's professional learning. We're trying to change that idea and the culture of what that means. Um, so 267 full-time faculty joined in professional learning in the last year. That's up from about 38 in my first year, 38 full-time faculty. So we're up to 267. I'm pretty proud of that. We're pretty proud of that. I'm proud of y'all. Um, faculty focus day, this is a new thing we tried to do to help celebrate the end of the year for all of your faculty. We had 60 of you show up. We expect that to be at least double this year since it is a celebration for you. And if you have any ideas of anything you want to do on faculty focus day, whether it's um, put a grill outside after lunch or for lunch and all that, whatever you want to do, we're open. Um, we also want to celebrate our faculty award winners as well, the Distinguished Faculty Awards on that date. The e-learning certificates, 32 earned. Student success certificates earned, 18 of those. Student success certificate, keep your eyes out on uh, for it. It is a combination of student services and academics kind of getting together to understand what the other house is doing so that we can serve our students a lot better. So please, please look out for that email next week. Um, 12 new faculty institute one and two and advanced institute graduates. This is something that has changed the culture of the new faculty um, institute faculty members. Um, so this is, we had 13 people show up yesterday for our new faculty orientation. So that's awesome. I see some of you in the audience. I've talked to you today. Um, and I will maintain, please reach out if you need anything. But what it is, is it's become professional learning over their first five years. And we see that it helps build a culture of that professional learning and seeing that cohort together. And I'm proud to say that all 13 have signed up to join our new faculty institute this year, which will hopefully lead into um, the next one and the next one. And that will build our retention, that will build the positivity and the culture that we have going here. Um, so we had the Carissa funded PD project. So out of 365-ish full-time faculty members, um, Y'all earned $300,000 using that program for professional learning. And 26 of you actually completed the 40 hours. So we were able to award the $2,000 to you. Um, we look for those opportunities. I look for those opportunities for all of you. So please, if you come up with an idea like that, send it my way. Um, and then 22 faculty, this is the highest ever. 22 faculty applied for and received the 1% salary incentive for professional development. So... Um, you all completed 120 hours of professional learning and received that 1% incentive. Um, just keep going through numbers. Lumen circles, you all took advantage of that. That is an ex We heard a lot of, I'm, I'm sick of the old recycled courses you, you guys are offering here at the college. So we can say, okay, we're going to maintain up 
upkeep of those courses and improve them and develop new ones. But at the same time, we understand there's some external opportunities you might want. So we look for ways that we can fund that as well. And that was for Lumen Circles and for AQ. And when we didn't have money, I went to Lumen and said, we want to get, so for you full-time faculty, there are funds set aside for you all to do professional learning. Adjuncts didn't have that. So went to Lumen and said, hey, we want the adjuncts to do this too. They said, okay, let's work on a grant. And thank you, Scott Case, and I saw you, uh, I saw you somewhere over there, but um, thank you for working on that Lumen grant for us. Um, and we were able to get thousands and thousands of dollars from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to support professional learning for uh, our adjunct faculty. Um, 18 student success, I already mentioned that one. All right, there, let's go with badging and credentialing. Um, this is new to FSCJ. This is not new to the world. Um, this is something that six years ago, no, before that, I was a faculty member still and said, hey, we need to start doing this badging stuff. This is, this is pretty cool. This was in, I don't know, 2012, 2013 or something. And then I worked for IT, in IT for a little bit and said, hey, this is something we should be doing. And no one's really listening, I guess, or, or wondering where the money is going to come from. And then I think Dr. Well got sick of me knocking on his door and you said, no, wait a minute. I've, heard, I've been hearing this too. I think we should be doing this stuff too. So um, it was, if I can get some funding from academics, some funding from business and some funding from uh, all over the place, maybe we can start doing credentialing here at FSCJ. Um, we're seeing that more and more on LinkedIn. And if we're working in community organizations, we see these badges and certificates going up for participation on county boards and for participatory things. So then we looked at how we can build that within uh, FSCJ. And the easy way to do it, where I didn't have to go through um, academics or I didn't have to go through the um, curriculum committees and things like that was professional learning. Let's start there. Let's start easy. And then continuing workforce education. So we started that partnership as well. And that's what sort of built that foundation for what we've got in badging. Um, we have offered hundreds of badges now. Um, we also have a process that you can go to online to request a badge. So if you have an idea, uh, maybe not a badge for my student was able to turn on the computer, but maybe a um, communications uh, excellence badge, which uh, Dr. Ertenberg and Dr. Hess helped design. So um, keep those ideas coming in. This is how we build this thing. So save the date, some uh, events coming up forward. Um, Science Symposium is the next one up uh, on October 14th, Professional Development Day. I, I see a woot woot from Evans in the back. Um, we've got math conference. I almost said mini conference. It's not a mini conference, it's big. Um, it's a two day event, Thursday night, Friday during the day. And then faculty focus day, we wanna really build up. And then I put two other things on the slide right before I send it to Dr. Wall was interest-based problem solving. You will hear about this. We'll keep mentioning it throughout the year. We're gonna start doing basic intro sessions for interest-based problem solving. We had Madison College who had um, a lot of work to be done in the area of negotiation years ago and they shared their experience with us and then shared the process of developing an interest-based problem solving office at their college where they actually can help facilitate conversations for committees, not just CBA, it's for anything. So when students and uh, uh, an instructor have an issue, there's a way and a facilitator to come in and help with that conversation. So keep your eyes open for that. Those, all of those sessions will be led by not just uh, a TOD member, but there will also be a faculty member or an administrator, et cetera. So it's a teamwork. We had our, our meeting for that this Monday, this last Monday, and we all met and talked about what we wanted in there. So um, I thank Halen and uh, Audrey and everybody that came to that meeting and helped us develop that course. Uh, and then bite-sized learning. Bite-sized learning is a new thing. We wanted to offer faculty something they could get and help um, during your lunch. So something nice and easy and quick. And some of them are gonna be specifically faculty focused and some are gonna be for all of staff. So our first one is coming up and it's on um, burnout. So which we can all kind of relate to at some point. Certificate programs. These are all because of you. You, you all said that these things are meaningful. Um, you said, you know, I. I need to get better at X, but I don't really have a pathway. I don't know what to take to get better at this thing. Um, and you see culturally responsive pedagogy up there. 
I'm um, very proud to be on that committee, um, and so all of you helped develop that. None of these are developed just by administrators. These are all faculty members that helped or touched or worked on or built completely. Um, so please take advantage of these certificate programs, and you'll get a pretty badge afterwards, um, which, which you can share out in your LinkedIn. Find it all out on training.fscj.edu. You all know that website by now, so I don't have to go over that. You also know about my learning, how to get uh, catched up on your professional um, learning and see how many hours you've earned and all of that. Um, want to talk about these faculty development specialists who are kicking A on each campus every day. You all know them. We love them. Um, I'll be, I'm happy to also say that there's, uh, in our department, 100% um, retention from the employees in my department over the last 10 years. That's because of you all. Um, they love working with you, it, uh, and they want to keep seeing you and keep working with you. That goes for these four people um, that are listed on here. Um, they do all kinds of cool stuff. The WebEx classrooms is one of the new things we're doing. I don't know if Audrey's going to talk a little bit about that, so I won't, but keep doing that. Um, and then our faculty resource centers. They talk about culture a lot today. Um, and I want to mention that our faculty resource centers need to become more of a communal place. We'd love to know if you would like a coffee maker and a refrigerator and if that would bring you to this place or whatever it would take to help bring that community back to each campus. We want to do that. So please uh, help us and come up with those ideas. Um, as Dr. Wall said earlier, um, Dr. Susan Slavitz has stepped down as director of the Academy for Teaching and Learning, but we um, will stay on as the associate director this um, fall. And um, uh, six years ago when we were starting this program, we begged and pleaded Audrey to be a member of the Academy in one way, shape, or form, and she said no. Uh, <laughs> she was working on her dissertation, and I totally respect that. Um, but finally, uh, we had the opportunity, um, and she would, uh, wanted to uh, accept the opportunity to become the director. So I introduce the new director of the Academy for Teaching and Learning, Audrey Antti. I wasn't expecting to be shamed like that. Like, we asked her, and she said no. So... Oh, okay. The, there's a big arrow on the clicker that shows you where to click, so that's very appreciative of that. Um, so yeah, I am now the director of the Academy of Teaching and Learning and extremely appreciative of all the work the Academy members have done, and Susan Slavic specifically. We wouldn't have nearly as many opportunities for faculty as we have now if it were not for those people. Um, and you can see the list of our, our Academy members and associate directors. We're spread out across the college at various campuses, although most of us, um, like many of you, are spending a great deal of time on online, um, possibly at home. Uh, you can still reach out to us if you have questions or if there's something that you want to see at your campus. And of course, the Academy email, um, academy at fscj.edu. You're always welcome to send questions or requests to that email. Um, just a couple of really quick points related to like our Academy website. We have lots of information there for you. We have a faculty resource repository. We're always looking for new information. So if you have something that you do that you think is really fantastic and would like to share with other faculty, maybe something that you've read um, or a particular way of supporting your students, please do send it to us and we can add it to our repository. Um, we also want to encourage you to travel um, and ask us for the money to travel. So we have gotten lots of feedback from faculty about, I know the process can be very complicated and sometimes frustrating. Um, however, we have worked to make it a little bit easier for everyone. And we do have one of our academy members who went through the training and now has a P card. So if you would like to travel, you apply and request funds from us. Um, and then if you would like to have the benefit of paying in advance for some of your travel experiences, you can connect with our academy member who has a P card. Can I say your name? Do you want to just, Matt Kyes. <laughs> um, and he will schedule a time to talk to you, meet with you, so that you guys can work together to make that arrangement. And I know it doesn't solve all of the problems process complications, um, but it really does help to have that piece sort of taken care of. So we are extremely appreciative of him doing that 
And if you notice, we still haven't had a year where we have spent all of our travel funds. We would like to do that this year. Um, so when we spend all of our travel funds, we can ask for more. <laughs> um, and we also support virtual conferences. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a big trip, especially if you have had the experience like Dr. Avendano of <laughs> having flight cancellations and getting stuck in cities. And many of us have had that experience over the last year. Um, but if you are interested in virtual conferences, you can still apply for the funds from us and we would be happy to pay for that for you. We also send out our Academy newsletter about once a month during the fall and spring um, and where there are maybe some general um, virtual opportunities available to faculty like Quality Matters had a virtual conference um, and we sent out a notification and invited faculty to let us know if they were interested and we used our travel funds to pay for the people who wanted to attend that virtual conference to attend. So we're interested in offering you those opportunities as well. Um, you've already heard from Mark Bosey and from um, Dr. Fontaine about our culturally responsive pedagogy certificate. I have to say about the Building Capacity for Change retreat, when I, when I arrived to the second day of the retreat to facilitate the last couple of workshops, that group of people had inside jokes and they had like special retreat names and there was just... It was across the board, people from a variety of disciplines, people at different points in their career. And I was not part of the inside jokes. Like I was the odd kid out, like, so why is that funny? <laughs> and trying to understand like what that experience was like. The people who participated really got a lot out of it. And our facilitators, so our facilitators who presented these extremely engaging workshops. So you're not talking about just sitting and listening. Um, you're talking about playing games and, you know, writing information on post-it notes and reflecting on your practice. I mean, you talk about like the theme of our, our, our convocation, like that was really an opportunity for faculty to think about like renewing themselves and reflecting on our practices. You know, what are we going to do, you know, this coming year? How are we going to implement these? And just kind of refreshing that idea that we love teaching, sometimes like it can be exhausting and we wanna kind of recapture that love for teaching. Um, we also have our student success certificate, which is, I guess I can take as long as I want, right? Cause nobody's gonna be going anywhere. No, no, so no, hurry it up. Um, which is, uh, as Mark Bosey mentioned, a cohort of people from kind of the academic side of the college and the student success side of the college. One of the, the cohort two members recently said in a meeting um, with me and Sarah Reardon that it was the most um, beneficial professional development activity he had engaged in, those series of workshops. He had more connections from that experience than, than he had ever experienced in any other professional development. So I'll plug that. Um, and then our Leadership Academy, of course, we encourage faculty to participate because we can serve in leadership positions as well. Um, not necessarily as like managers or supervisors, but if you end up leading a committee, God help you, you know, you might want some of the skills that you learn from leadership committee in order to kind of facilitate that. And then I'm just going to leave with the Academy email um, so that Dr. Turner can, can come up and present. And I was watching the time mark and I just want you to say, I only took like three minutes and you went for like 17 minutes. I'm just putting that up. Thank you, Dr. Ante. Um, I now know why the umbrellas got oohs and ahs at convocation. Okay. Um, don't miss the nuance. It was not long ago, if you were going to travel, you might ask in your department and what you heard about funds, etc. Faculty, have the funds. Started at $25,000. You have an advocate in Dr. John Woodward at $75,000 right now. Okay, that's how we want to run things. Okay, don't miss the nuance. If we're engaged, you heard, I love what Audrey said about that retreat. It's not just about look at the curriculum and integrate. It's integrating in that sense too, that people make those connections. It just makes us better. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Audrey, for being up here. Um, IT and in particular academic technology, 
which really wants to connect um, with academics. They tried with convocation. There are always complications and times and this and that. So Brandy and I worked it out. And so please um, welcome Ms. Brandy Bleak, Academic Technology. So as a man of no pretense, do you have slides? I do. They're after riches. If you fast forward. Pay no matter to the uh, slides. As I said, Brandy Bleak. Thank you much. Thank you for letting me in the Cool Kids Club. I really like being here. As you guys all know, I um, am not in academics, but I play nicely. So I like to bring all the IT information to you. So can you believe that three years ago we were transitioning over to Canvas? That was one of the biggest projects. Yeah, right. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, that was one of the biggest projects that most of us have ever even been a part of. But what if I told you then that that, that was going to be nothing compared to what we are about to embark on with that shift in education that we definitely remember. So take a moment to think of everything that has transpired since then. My little guy, he talks back now. Some of you may have even got a glimpse of that during those 2020 work from home meetings. <laughs> Consider how your students, yourselves, our administrators, and specifically our technology has evolved. You may be pleased to know that there are no big transitions today, no big changes to discuss. I'm only here to share some of the innovations that have emerged out of the past few years. Let's start with a quick video to highlight two of the new technology solutions available to you now. No, go back. I promise I work in IT. I hear Beth yelling at me in the background. Oh. This worked perfectly yesterday in the run through. It's fair, it's fair. Well, the two faculty that are in there are here. They could just come react out the video. <laughs> File corruption, awesome. So I will bring this back and it'll be a big suspense, um, a, a, an area of suspense until you get the newsletter that I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. So as you saw in that really cool video that we just played, <laughs> WebEx classrooms are probably one of my favorite new technologies that we've announced or released. Um, I'm really excited to see what you guys do with the WebEx classrooms. They give us the technology to teach online and in person at the same time, while we can record and share um, and do all of the things that we would do in a traditional classroom while being, like I said, both online and in person. Also in that amazing video, the virtual desktop infrastructure, or VDI, is something that almost everybody can use. Right now, everyone does have a basic virtual desktop infrastructure available to them. But if you use software in your courses, who uses any type of software? OK, so this technology, it's for you. With the virtual desktop, software is no longer tied to the room or the lab, but instead, it's tied to your students or your course. So wherever your students are, whether that's at Starbucks or at home, Hawaii, I don't know, do our students go to Hawaii? If they do, they should take me with them. Um, all that they need to do, all you need to do is fill out the VDI form that is in our newsletter, and you can request your software available to your students virtually. So that is also available now. Forgot that my slides weren't progressing. Ha. There we go. Windows 11. All of our classrooms, our smart classrooms, our LLCs, our labs, they've now been updated to Windows 11. We'd also like to recommend that our faculty and staff update your computers as well. As a Mac user, I will even say I like the ease of the Windows 11 and the look of the taskbar. I saw an improvement there. The system status page is something that I have been looking forward to for a little while now. We've been discussing it in IT for a while. 
but with the addition of the new page that you can visit at status.fscj.edu, you can visit that to see how any system is performing at any time. So it looks like everything is good to go right now, or when I took the screenshot anyway. Along with the site, I'm going to try to talk over the thunder here. Um, along with the site, our emails that we send out, if there's an outage or a maintenance window, they'll now have a nice consistent look to them as well. Student two-factor authentication is another really good project that I hope that our students are just as happy as we were when we rolled out the two-factor. Um, since the last week and a half when we rolled out the project, over 13,000 students have already enrolled via uh, SMS, email, or the one login application. I like the app. That's the way that I do it. Who else uses the app versus SMS? It, that security factor is important, but also this tool will allow them to reset their password without needing to call it into the help desk, which I know that team loves. All right, this is another one that our team recently learned about. It was free, we integrated it. It was one of the easiest things we've done in a very long time, and it's very helpful to students. Draft Coach is a tool that helps your students in any course that involves writing. It highlights grammar mistakes instead of fixing it for them like some of the other tools. It provides explanations to help their understanding, and it's available when using the browser version of Microsoft Word. Now, you don't think I could come here without talking about IT Canvas just a little bit, right? So here are the top five things that I would like to request or ask, or at least introduce to you if it's something that you haven't considered yet. I think three years ago, I might have said to John Wall is, as a joke, can we just make everyone use Canvas? I know, I know. But if I had one wish, I think I would like to ask you to use it to become familiar with it, but even if it's just for grades or syllabus. All of your students that have a course, most of them are going to use Canvas. Some of them may not. But if they had that consistent experience, I think that alone would help our students become familiar with where they can go for certain things within the courses. Did you know that you can access Canvas directly via canvas.fscj.edu? Sometimes I hear people say you, you can go to this site and access it or go to the portal and, and access it there, which you can. But if you'd like to tell your students and yourselves, just go directly and save yourself a step or two. Before publishing your courses, I'd like to ask that you just go to Course Settings and click the Link Validator button. That will simply make sure that all of the links within your course may be copied over, maybe grabbed from a website that no longer is updated. All of those links will work. That is our biggest ask this year. It used to be publishing your course. Thanks to some amazing uh, spreadsheets that we send over to Rich, publishing has improved significantly. But link validator is the one thing that we can improve a little bit. Just a very common question that we get and something that's easily fixed. Two more things that I'm going to touch back on what John was saying earlier. Your Canvas homepage is your first introduction that your students get when they go into Canvas. Does it feel welcoming? Do they know who you are and what to expect in that course? The best way to change that is to set that home page. See, they agree. So the best way to do that is to humanize that experience, create a photo, create a video, and that will lead into the next page, or the next tip. Create a video announcement and send that out every week, even if it's 30 seconds or 10 seconds. Hey, everybody, it's Monday. It's raining outside. I'd like to have a great week. Let me know if you have any questions. Record it in studio, and if you're really advanced or thinking ahead, Record 12 weeks of them or seven weeks of them. Don't say things like on Monday, August 25th or 29th, but say on Monday we're going to do this. And you can send that and use that in every course from here on out. Change it a little here and there, but it sets you up for the full term and you can do that in advance. So those are my five wish list items. If you have any questions, of course, you can ask me. We have a lot of information within our blog and newsletter. Some of you I promise. There we go. Go back. I'm looking at the wrong slides here. There we go. No, it's OK. Our blog and newsletter, you already know what it's like. There's not a picture of it, but I don't need to do that because you guys visit it all the time, right? <laughs> so we, our team constantly shares out articles and blog posts relevant to either IT updates or Canvas feature releases. And those items we send out every week in a newsletter, sometimes every other week, depending on the content load. I know that all of you read it yesterday, because I can see in my list 
But if for some reason you glanced over and weren't able to look at yesterday's newsletter, go back. It's probably not in your trash box, probably not in archive, but if it is, you can get it out, no big deal. Take a look at that, scroll through the template for the home pages that John Woodward was speaking of, that's in there. There's a link to some of the Canvas tips that I talked about. And also, if there's anything else that we need to put in there, I'd love to ask you to share that. There's something, I think John, we and I talked about the home pages. We built something, I made a video, there's a template, there's a blog post. We like to communicate however works for you. So let us know how we can improve our services. And just as a reminder, we're here to support you. Thanks for letting me join the kids, our cool kids club. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I did. Ah, this is a great question, and I will take 30 seconds only. A year ago, we were saying we're probably going to do away with Big Blue Button. It's not necessarily. We signed a year contract. We still have Big Blue Button. However, our team used to push Big Blue Button. The WebEx features that have came out in the last couple of years, really significant. I would ask each of you to try it if you haven't. The WebEx classroom, completely different. It utilizes WebEx, of course, but it's simply technology within a classroom that allows you to teach virtually and in person and let the technology do the heavy lifting. But yes, still have Big Blue Button. WebEx is worth a try now. Brandy, thank you so much. Um, if you are going to be teaching, if you're going to be in the game another two, three years, we knew digital was coming. It's all evolved. Two, three years, you could probably hang on doing what you're doing. If you're going to be any longer than that, we need to pay increasing attention to stuff that's coming out of academic technology to be on top of our games because students are, are connecting with us every which way and the technology keeps on marching. So it's a really important conversation to keep up. Um, a little bit behind the curtains here. All right. The end of this week and, and heading to the next board, um, we'll be sending forward to the state of Florida um, our report on college affordability. And what that has to do with legislatively driven is are we adopting textbooks on time? Okay. So we've worked to try to improve that process and nudge. And please know um, we are but the, the intermediaries here between us and the state. Um, over the past few years, we have gotten better and better and better at that. Behind that kind of bureaucratic charge, there is an intent, and that intent is to recognize that the costs beyond tuition for students um, to get uh, course materials, you know, textbooks, lab materials, et cetera, continue to increase at a very rapid rate. So we're living in that marketplace. How many of you have heard of FSCJ's access plan? FSCJ access, okay. So uh, Dr. Rich Turner um, did a fantastic job working with book companies to tie them all together so we weren't having multiple different conversations and said, if, if you want to come with us, let's get under one tent. And right now through the access plan, um, students are able to use the money that they might have through financial aid, et cetera, so that they have their book before they go. And what we know is that they'll get their book at, at the lowest price that they can get for a new book. And we get all of those comparisons. Um, since over the last three terms, we had 17 classes participate, 206 students. And if you look at what they would have paid versus what they did pay, $14,000. Last fall, a year ago, 301 classes, over 500, over 5,500 students. And if you look at the difference between what they actually paid and what they would have paid without access, $228,000. This fall, we're heading in right now, we have gone from 301 classes last fall to 767 classes this fall. I am not here to shill for FSCJ access. I do want to thank you for your help with timely book adoptions. But it is a reality for students that they have to stretch to, to, to pay that money. So 
in the coming weeks, we're going to talk to you a little bit more about that. And Doug, you asked me a question about your slides, and the answer is no. So, Dr. Doug Hines was on that faculty retreat that we talked about a little while ago, and, and I had an opportunity to say howdy do in the morning. And um, I came back in the afternoon, and they were talking about something called community of practice, and, and Dr. Kynes happened to be speaking. Um, oh, Doug, no, I'm going to do a full audible. I'm going to do it. Oh, just hang. Um, and he's talking about some work that he's doing on a grant and trying to promote open educational resources. And I'm aware that this grant is out there, but it's like a lot of things. You know, it's, it's just it's good work that's happening at FSCJ. But as I listened to it, and, and a comment that he made about processes, um, you know, access is really taking off. And the person who's driving access is Dr. Rich Turner. Um, I see him more days than I don't see him. So access is up there. He's working just as hard, but he's on a different approach, open educational resources. But he doesn't have kind of the same audience. So on the spot, it's a little reason why we packed the agenda. I said, Doug, would you be willing to come and talk about it at Academic Plenary? Again, I'm not asking you to go and use open educational resources any more than I'm asking you to use FSCJ access. But I am going to ask you to look as an individual and also maybe even collectively as a department to get into one of these games some way, somehow, and say, is there something we can do where we maintain the standard of rigor? We don't want in, uh, inadequate course materials, but do it in a way that saves students some money. So, Doug, I appreciate you taking me up on that offer. I apologize that we've had a slide snafu, but in the interest of getting off to a good start, I'm going to leave that conversation there for right now, but we are going to follow up and try to give everybody some more information about this before we head into spring. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, you have class prep, this storm ahead of you. And what I want to ask you to do is have a fantastic launch. Let's treat it like a test flight. Let's do what we can. Let's continue to grow strong. My door is always open. Please have a fantastic semester. Thank you so very much.